that's the, 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 the magical, can't-miss formula that was bestowed upon us, you know, say, 100 years ago. It's this whole idea of mass production, right? And the idea that um, we not only want to sell a lot of stuff, but the more we sell, the cheaper it gets, right? That was the great success. That this, and this is really good, because selling more you know, raises the top line, and, and that selling more, the economies of scale, are going to lower the bottom line, and that's going to, wow, this is really great. Okay? And I think it's fair to say that most businesses today are still operating under that principle. Coming up with a particular product or service idea, selling a whole lot of it, doing it at low cost, trying to achieve high share, that's great, it's going to make our shareholders happy, but it's not going to make them maximally happy because our shareholders aren't content with us making as much money doing whatever it is that we do. They want, they want growth, right? They want more. And so where does growth come from in a, you know, again, a traditional world? How do we achieve growth? So, so new markets. So we're going to take these wonderful products and services that you know, some group of customers have, have enjoyed, and we're going to uh, bring them to others who just haven't had the benefit of, of, of dealing with our, our great products and services. What's the other path to growth? Diversification. So new products, diversification. So, and again, I'm going to claim that both of them are the same thing. Both of them are just extending the product. In one way, it is going to be you know, taking the product and extending it either on a geographic basis or to new segments or to new uses, right? The other way is to take that basic product expertise that we have and do a little bit of R&D on it and come up with either a new improved version or maybe a seemingly different product that's really kind of the same thing but just with different you know, label, right? So one way or another, we're going to take that product expertise that has made us uh, pretty successful uh, and, and find ways to extend it. Back in the old days, Henry Ford didn't know whether he was selling one million cars to one person or one car to a million different people. He didn't know, it was impossible, he didn't really care. All he wanted to do was sell a lot of stuff and get the cost down. That's all that mattered, okay? But today we do have the capability to know whether it's the same person buying this stuff over and over and over, okay? And the ability to kind of zoom in on different kind of people. And of course, again, this is near and dear to my because this is what I do for a living. Maybe we could actually build our business around the data. Okay, it just wasn't an option before, but maybe it opens up new kinds of business models that just were, were inconceivable previously. Super duper customer service does not mean customer centricity. Customer centricity does mean super duper customer service, fill in the blanks for me, for the really good customers. But for the other customers, eh, glad to have you buy from us, it's going to be on our terms. Why bother making those valuable customers wait on lines and go through the process from the beginning as if they're a rookie customer when we know all this stuff about them, right? And why not make recommendations to them? Oh, we have you know, the, the, this different kind of massage service than you've had before. You know, here's a coupon to try that out as well. Neiman Marcus okay, has a new uh, iPhone app. So as soon as you walk into the store, Okay, it recognizes that it's your phone, and so somewhere on some central computers, it's gonna um, it's gonna ping someone saying, "Hey, really good customers in the store. Drop whatever you're doing and go treat that customer well." Okay, and it has its creepy aspects as well, and I'm not sure they can pull this off effectively. But what I really like about it are the words down here that the key to a terrific retail experience is personal and differentiated service. And again, whether they can do that successfully, I don't know. But I agree, as opposed to the one-size-fits-all, every customer is king, customer is always right mentality that most retailers tend to have. Okay? I'd claim that's a step in the right direction. Does this apply only to giant B2C enterprises? Quite to the contrary, what we're trying to do over here is to mimic what B2B firms with a relatively small number of customers have been doing forever. Okay, so a B2B company that has just a small number of customers knows which ones to treat really well. That's why God invented golf, right? <laughs> and which ones, eh, if you want to buy from us, here's someone to take your order. They know that. So what we're trying to do over here is to more or less automate that to be able to do that kind of B2B thing on a much larger scale. So, so sort of, yes, what I'm talking about, it tends to be 
B2C, lots of data available, internal capabilities to do that. But we're not trying to invent something new. We're just trying to, to mimic a, a good business practice that's existed for a long time. In contrast to the product-centric world, what's the single overarching objective that we want to achieve? Understand your customers. Nah, it's a means to an end. What is it that we want to achieve in the customer-centric world? It's the same thing, right? We still want to maximize shareholder value, okay? Trick question, okay, but not a tricky answer. And, and I really want to emphasize that because there's too many people out there think, oh, well, you know, the customer centricity, it's kind of like communism, you know? We're not, we're not going to do that. Come on, we're not goofing around here. We're here to make money, okay? And that's why we're volume cost kind of thing. So I just want to make it real clear, okay, that, that customer centricity is absolutely about the same thing. It's just a very different way of getting there. When I'm talking about profitability over here, what more specifically am I referring to? Over the future, okay? I don't want to just sort people out based on their past profitability. I want to sort them out based on their ongoing lifetime value. That's a much better indication of what these customers are worth as opposed to what they've been doing or not doing over the past two years. That's just kind of an extreme example, but, but you get the idea. It's the future value that we want to sort people out on, not past profits. And you would think, well, aren't past profits a good mirror to the future? Eh, they're not bad. But there's lots and lots and lots of examples where they're not so good. Past profits, that flow of transactions, will give us a lot of insight into the customers to understand who will be valuable and why. So we want to use that data, but we don't want to necessarily reward people specifically because of it. One thing we can do is take our existing customers, sort them out, and, and, and make some of them more valuable. Okay, and so I'm going to call that a specific example of what we call customer development. Looking at our existing customers, making them more valuable. Okay, that's just one of the three tactics that I want to talk about. Customer acquisition. Okay, so we're going to find, by, by using lots and lots of data about our customers, by really diving into the database, we're not just going to go on this big, broad fishing expedition, but we're going to know where to fish. Okay, so much more efficient and effective customer acquisition and development, and what's the third one? Retention. Okay, so here we go. So let's just spend a, just a couple of seconds talking about each one. Again, a whole course about this stuff if you want to come on back. So again, I, I already met, come on back, why not? Do you like Huntsman Hall? It's a beautiful place, right? So your customer acquisition, this idea that instead of just having this one big broadcast message that we can know where to place those messages. Because we know who are the more valuable customers, what do they have in common, what makes them different than other kinds of customers. And when I'm talking about these things, the characteristics that distinguish the more valuable customers from the less valuable customers, most of you are think I'm talking about what? Or most companies would hear that phrase and would, would turn to demographics. demographics. What's the color of their skin? How old are they? What zip code do they live in? No, no, no! What should we be talking about? Behavior. behavior, right? Let's look at the channel that we acquired them through. Let's look at which would ad campaign brought them to us. Let's look at the first product that they bought from us. Let's look at referrals, things like that. Behavior, okay? So, so doing acquisition better. Retention, I, I, you know. Look, these are tactics that you understand. These are tactics that companies do. But I'm claiming that these tactics need to be done at a much higher level in the organization. But the point that I really like to emphasize, as I pointed out this one before, instead of divergent thinking, it's this idea of conversion thinking. It's this idea that here's this really valuable set of customers. What can we do for them? What products can we develop? What competing products and services should we give to them or offer to them to make them even more valuable than they would have been otherwise? Okay, so how do we do everything possible, even outside the confines of our corporation, to make this customer more valuable than they would have been otherwise. You still need to have some product centricity in you because for that other 80% of your customers who aren't worth much, you're still going to want to do things in a high volume, low cost way. But it's for those, it's, it's identifying and treating differently those, those better customers. And there are some companies that are, that are quite good at that.